that I am working on with my TA this year. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get all of the models in the lab. I'm, I'm going to have him scan them in and get make these three-dimensional images of them that will have labels and they'll all be embedded in the Moodle so that uh, you can, uh, from home, um, be able to peruse each of the models uh, that we have uh, with and without labels. So he probably is not going to get to all that for your use this year, uh, but hopefully some of that will, will come online um, and it, it should be a useful study aid for you. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about epithelial and connective tissues, and then how those two uh, help to form what is called the integument. Epithelium and connective tissue form the integument. There's a haiku that you should take to heart. So the human body is an amazing, an amazing community of cells. You know, it's, it's hard for the planet Earth to live in harmony with 8 billion people, but your body has managed to do it with 50 trillion cells uh, of 200 different types, each um, supporting the other. A couple definitions. Tissues, a tissue, is a collection of cells. <clears throat> uh, and, and they're products and byproducts that form a sp specific, very limited uh, function. This is in contrast to the concept of an organ. This is a, a macroscopic structure uh, that's going to have very clearly delineated boundaries. All right, and you can point to it and say, this is uh, an organ that serves this host of functions and is typically uh, made up of many types of tissues uh, that are working together. Did anybody, uh, does anybody read the Huffington Post? It's probably not your generation's type website. But the Huffington Post yesterday um, kind of hilariously announced that scientists had found a new organ in the human body, that they've identified a new... Did anybody hear this? No? You did? And do you, what did you hear about it? I, um, I didn't hear much. I think mean, it's just an article. I don't even know if it was from the Huffington Post. Isn't it something that lines that connects the intestines to the stomach? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's called the mesentery. The mesentery. And, and for... I mean, it's kind of an anticlimactic and, and hilarious designation. It's like, is Pluto a planet or not a planet? Um, the way they were saying, is this organ hiding in plain sight? Well, no, no anatomist or physician who's ever taken an anatomy class, or anybody doesn't, hasn't come in contact with the mesentery. They just decided to call it its own organ. But it, it, the mesentery is a sheet uh, of... Uh, the, the peritoneum. So we talked about the, the peritoneum uh, in the intestines um, yesterday in the abdomen. And it's just that sheet of serous fluid, or uh, not fluid, uh, serous membrane as it's going out and enveloping the intestines. It's the, it's the part of the, uh, that peritoneum that s attaches back to the wall of the abdomen and all the blood vessels run through the mesentery to feed uh, the gut. It's, it's not maybe as, it's not as big a revelation as the media would have, you think. <clears throat> Anyways, in Oregon. Um, there are four types of general classifications of tissue. Those are epithelial and connective tissue, uh, both of which we're going to talk about today in the, general, uh, in the general form. And then there's neural tissue and muscle tissue. So epithelia covers exposed surfaces. It's on any kind, any surface of something that's open. 
your skin, the lining of your intestines, the collecting ducts and, and convoluted tubules of the kidneys, the surface of uh, the um, tympanic canal in the ear. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere, covering any sort of cavity, the surface of any cavity. Um, connective tissue is as, by and large, is as it describes itself. Um, it fills the spaces. It's a little bit like the glue of the body. Um, it, it underlies epithelium. It holds different structures together. There's a wide uh, variety of purposes, functions, that connective tissue uh, store, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, has. <clears throat> it also, uh, so the blood and adipose tissue or fat uh, tissue is uh, also considered to be a connective tissue. So it is able to transport um, nutrients, materials, other uh, chemicals, uh, metabolites in the body. And of course, adipose tissue is one of the primary energy storage molecules uh, or compartments in the body. Neural tissue is the, in the domain of the nervous system, and it's responsible for uh, conduction of electrical signals. And then, of course, muscle tissue is the contractile tissue of the body that enables various structures to move. <clears throat> so moving on. Here is an outline of all of that. And I put this up here for you because this is perhaps um, helpful for you to see how I organize it. Maybe, you know, you guys are all pretty high flyers sitting in here in a, in a sophomore level uh, biology class at Colby College. So maybe showing somebody how uh, to break material down into a clear, organized outline fashion is a little bit redundant uh, for some of you, but I'm going to do it because you'd be surprised how many people um, do not have very good organizational skills when it comes to that. Uh, and it'll help me talk about what, uh, it'll help me show you what we're going to talk about today. So within epithelia, um, there are two general categories. Those categories are epithelia proper and then glands. <clears throat> Proper epithelial tissue is uh, broken up into the three categories that I introduced you to last night in lab, uh, the squamous, the cuboidal, and the columnar. And then within each of those general morphologic uh, designations or structural designations, we have these different um, categories. So there's simple squamous epithelium. What do I mean by that? Does anyone remember what I meant by a simple squamous epithelium? It's just a single layer. Um, and then we have two stratified uh, types of squamous epithelia, the, the mesothelium and the endothelium. Um, and then within cuboidal epithelium, there is the simple cuboidal epithelium, like the stuff you would find in uh, the convoluted tubules of the kidneys. Uh, and then you have various... Uh, layered uh, cuboidal, such as stratified and transitional epithelium. We'll talk about both of those. And then finally, we have columnar epithelium, which um, has a simple manifestation, a single layer. And then there are these pseudostratified and fully stratified columnar epithelium. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium, it just rolls off the tongue. Um, pseudo meaning that it looks stratified on histologic examination. When you look at it, it looks like it's layered, but in fact it's not. It's, it is a simple layer of epithelium, uh, columnar epithelium, but they are highly convoluted with one another so that on tissue section they look pseudo stratified. Thus the name. We'll see some examples of that. Then glands. <clears throat> Um, there are two types of glands. There are endocrine glands. Uh, unfortunately, we will not get to talk much about the endocrine system. I am going to be talking about endocrine function uh, just a little bit, maybe, 
Although this year, the endocrine falls on, ta on Martin Luther King Day, so I think I've cut that lecture out. Uh, we won't talk about it this year. But in the spring, I'm going to be talking about it in 275, although I think you guys aren't able to take that class. Um, and then exocrine glands. And uh, there's a, a variety of different uh, exocrine glands that we're going to talk about in detail. Then we'll move on to connective tissue. There are uh, three types, three broad categories of CT. Uh, connective tissue proper, which um, has dense and loose connective tissue um, with nine various cell types making up these uh, two categories of uh, connective tissue proper. And then there are fluid connective tissues, the blood, uh, the, the interstitial fluid, the lymph, and finally, uh, the supportive connective tissues, cartilage and bone. Um, we won't be talking about muscle and neuro tissue today because uh, that's outside the scope of the class, uh, today's lecture. But uh, we will be, hopefully, uh, time permitting, talking about different types of membranes. And I do not mean plasma membrane. What is a plasma membrane? What's the plasma membrane? Say it. Yeah, it's the bilipid layer. Um, for those of you who haven't had a, a cell biology or a, a basic biology class, you, do you have to take biology to get in here? So you've heard about the plasma membrane. You guys are shy. It's early, maybe. <clears throat> this is not that kind of membrane. This is not a cellular membrane. This is a tissue membrane. All right. Uh, so it's a, a, a step up in the in the hierarchy. Um, there are, there are four types. There's the mucous membranes, the serous membrane. We talked about serous membranes yesterday, about the pleura, the pericardium, and the peritoneum. We talked about those in the lab. And then there are synovial and cutaneous membranes, cutaneous being the skin. All right. Um, embryology itself uh, can easily form a, a, a year-long sequence at the graduate or medical school level. It is a, a, a profoundly involved uh, topic. <clears throat> and we're not even, we're, we're just going to mention that it exists here uh, by way of this slide. So here is uh, the primordial yolk sac. Um, in, in this developing embryo, and this yolk sac, it becomes the origin of any endoderm in the, in the human. <clears throat> this becomes uh, the, line, the mucus lining of your entire GI tract. I mean, you can kind of think of yourself as a giant tube. I know it's not a very flattering way to think of uh, your, your human self, but we are sort of an alimentary tube, and, and the lining of that tube is uh, covered by endoderm. You, you think about it, the, the lining of your GI tract, that compartment, is in, in contiguosity, is contiguous with your respiratory tract, right? You could walk up your esophagus and down your larynx and end up in your lungs uh, if you were real tiny. And uh, so all of that surface is uh, composed of endoderm. <clears throat> um, the ectoderm, going on the other on the other end of the spectrum, end, uh, ends up forming uh, the skin and uh, the the nervous system. Um, I shouldn't say skin; it's the epidermis and the, and the nervous system, the very outer layer of 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 the skin. Finally, everything else is mesoderm. Uh, this includes <coughs> mesenchymal cells, muscle, heart, kidney, bone, and blood. All right. So here is a very generalized picture of, yeah, just generic uh, epithelial cell. I said we had epithelia and glands. What are the characteristics of epithelium? Well, there's cellularity uh, to epithelial cells. They have these junctions. You may think, well, that doesn't, aren't all cells connected to one another somehow? Uh, epithelial cells have long, extended, pervasive boundaries with other epi epithelial cells. Neurons are mostly 
in isolation, in isolation with little dendrites connecting one another in complicated patterns. They don't have large swaths of their plasma membrane in, in contact with one another. Um, connective tissue often has no contact with any cells. They're moving around sometimes uh, if it's a macrophage or something. Uh, epithelial cells have a polarity to them. What do I mean by polarity? Yep, that's it. There's a top and a bottom. There's a directionality. And that seems like something very intuitive and basic and Wow, so what? It's actually been a mystery, an active area of study for a very long time in uh, cell biology as to how cells initially exert their own polarity. Uh, what is it that tells a cell that one end of itself is up and the other is down? Um, stem cells, embryologic stem cells, uh, at, the very, at the very beginning of conception, those uh, cells, there is no polarity to them. And how is it that a cell begins to establish polarity? How does it know which end it's going to choose? So one of the, one of the characteristics of epithelium is that there is th this polarity to it. Um, it. Because of that polarity, there's going to be a difference in function uh, from one end to the other. The uh, the apical, or I'm sorry, the, the basal lateral end, the basal uh, end of the cell, the bottom in, in sort of uh, common parlance is characterized by a, a connectivity, an attachment to a basement membrane. Um, because of uh, the cellularity, these junctions uh, between themselves, epithelial uh, cell layers uh, tend to exclude vasculature. They're, they're avascular. Uh, we cannot get the extravasation of uh, materials between them. And then epithelial cells are able to regenerate. Uh, when they become damaged, they can divide and replace uh, their lost, the lost members. What do they do? Well, they offer physical protection. Um, control permeability. Now, this, this function is related to their cellularity. Uh, cells that have these long, tight junctions between them are essentially gatekeepers along that, that boundary, whatever that boundary is, some luminal space outside the surface, above the surface, and then things that are below it, things uh, may want to pass a bacteria or nutrients or what what have you some sort of uh, white blood cell may want to pass that that uh, that epithelial layer and it's the job of the epithelial cells to be the gatekeeper to say no bacteria you cannot come through and white blood cell yes you can pass through we're going to take in uh, this range of nutrients that's in the digestive lumen and these other things that are out there, we don't want them to pass. They're going to have a selective permeability, which is why the structural feature of cell cellularity, the, the junctions between the cells, becomes so functionally important. Um, epithelial cells, <clears throat> some epithelial cells uh, have become specialized to provide uh, sensation. Um, uh, and to help uh, attenuate or modify the type of uh, sensory input that a, a particular nerve ending may be picking up on. Um, and they also make secretions, particular uh, specialized secretions. This is, uh, cells that do this are part of glandular epithelia. So in that, in that category, there's proper epithelium and then glandular epithelium. And glandular epithelium are the ones that are going to be making these special uh, secretions. Um, I'm not going to go through any of the anatomy there on the right-hand side. I'm going to assume you guys know that. Okay. 
So these intercellular connections. So they talk about this stuff in, in, in basic, in a biology class. Have you guys had this before? The tight junctions, gap junctions, demos desmosomes. OK. Um, <clears throat> well, there are four types of um, ways that epithelial cells are able to connect with one another. And each of these modes of connection is mediated by a different set of proteins, uh, a different host of protein apparatus that's going to help uh, these cells uh, maintain their, their connectivity. The first one, so say we, we have up here on the, on the top of that cell, you see all the villi uh, or the cilia or whatever those are meant to be uh, up here. So this is going to be the apical surface. This is the basal lateral surface. Um, as something that's up there wants to come through, the first job of the epithelium is to say, you shall not pass. And so what it uses to do that are these tight junctions. Uh, the name is very descriptive. They form very tight, impermeable junctions so that any microorganism that may be probing the surface of that epithelial layer is not going to find any gaps. You're going to find a lot of surface area because of all those cilia. There's going to be a lot of surface area for the transfer of small molecules, perhaps nutrients, maybe, in the, in the intestinal lumen. Uh, or maybe it's for the production of mucus and re releasing mucus because it's in the nasal passages or something. But there's not going to be any gaps to get down uh, past the biochemically unique plasma membrane of the ciliated apical surface. All right? So the, that ciliated apical surface of those cells are going to have a unique biochemical, uh, biomolecular receptor profile. Right? There's going to be special receptors that are being expressed up in those cilia, up on that apical surface, that's going to make that plasma membrane different than the plasma membrane anywhere else in that epithelium. And that, and that specialized plasma membrane is going to be isolated from the rest of the cell by these tight junctions. It's basically like uh, a weld, a weld that, that goes between every single cell that is uh, joined to one another uh, along its apical surface. All right, T tight junctions, nothing gets through them. Um, plasma membrane, I'm assuming. I don't see where you're seeing it. Oh, yeah, fused at the plasma membrane. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, yep, we'll get to you. Is it like one single protein? No, 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 no. It, it's, it's a little bit like a zipper. It's a, so lots and lots, and in fact, it, they sort of schematically uh, draw it like that in that picture up there, that cartoon, where it's these proteins that are, that are self-similar and interact with themselves, uh, and, they f and there's repeating teeth that will zip uh, themselves along. So there's anywhere from two to ten layers of these, of these uh, proteins in, in, uh, at the top of the tight junction, and then right as part of that complex, there's this thing called an adhesion belt, um, and you see, you'll see that adhesion belt in that cartoon there. The adhesion belt is tied into an actin network at the top of uh, the it, actin is a structural protein. It's, it's basically just like the framework protein that, that the cell uses uh, to help uh, manage torsional stress on the on the on the epithelium and to like monitor uh, monitor the, the sort of the tensegrity uh, of of that, that surface. All right, so next on the list here, uh, I'm going to actually skip gap junctions, and I'll come back to those, because I think those are the most interesting, uh, and we'll go to desmosomes. So desmosomes are, you know, I, I realize that uh, I'm not quite a dinosaur, but I'm, uh, I'm a pretty uh, ancient beast to some of you guys here, all of you guys. When I was in high school, there was shop class. They still have that, I hope. I don't know if they do. But when I was in shop class, they had this machine called the spot welder. You take a couple pieces of sheet metal, and you stick it in between these two 
uh, electrodes, uh, they look like fingers, would come together and go zap, and it would send a spark, and the, the two pieces of sheet metal would be welded at that little spot where it sent the electrical thing through. That's the way, when I first learned about desmosomes, that's the way I thought about it. Desmosomes are basically just spot welds, um, places along the surface of uh, the plasma membrane where the two membranes are fused together. And though that fusion is tied in to the actin network. Uh, and the intermediate, so we say, have these intermediate filaments, uh, so described here, uh, that are going out into the scaffolding, into the superstructure of the cell, helping the cell understand what kind of torsional stress is being placed on the, on the cell. So is the cell getting yanked this way or yanked that way? And it's helping uh, add structural stability uh, throughout the plane of the epithelial layer. Um, hemidesmosomes, hemidesmosomes right here, are the same as a desmosome, except that uh, they're slightly different protein components, but they're still tying into this intermediate filament network in the, uh, in the uh, body of the cell, in the cytoskeleton, uh, except that a hemidesmosome is attached to the basement membrane. And they call it hemi. Hemi means half, because only half it has only half uh, the protein complement that a regular desmosome would have. Two cells that the, uh, each with half of a desmosome are going to interact to form the, the, the overall complex. Here, it's a hemidesmosome because uh, it's interacting with the basement membrane, and there's slightly different proteins that are coming in and interacting with that cytoskeletal framework. Am I, am I going too fast using words people aren't comfortable with? Okay. Gap junctions. Gap junctions are cool. I think gap junctions are really interesting. Um, so has anybody ever seen a, a, a grommet? Has anybody sail or used a tarp or know what a grommet is? It's just those, like a, in a tarp or a piece of canvas, it's uh, a metal ring that has a hole through it. There's a metal ring with a hole through it. Um, that's the way I envision gap junctions. Uh, it's one of those little grommets that has pinned two cells together, but there's a hole through them so that solutes can pass back and forth. The consequence is epithelial cells that have these gap junction connections, not all do, but if they do, they're called synstitial. Synstitial. Syn, S Y N. Uh, stitial, meaning that they are able to share, the, they're able to share their interstitium or their cytosol. All right, synstitial. Um, this opens up a lot of interesting capabilities for epithelial cells. Uh, I, I began to, to talk about a sort of passion of mine, which is uh, the origin of life and and the biological origin of consciousness and all this stuff, which is its own course. But um, there are reasons to believe that gap junctions are involved in that process. So I'll, I'll leave it there. We'll, do, we'll just leave it there to keep moving. All right, so I showed you this uh, slide yesterday. We got simple and stratified, uh, which is a single and multi layer uh, arrangements uh, in terms of squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. Uh, I did not show you pictures of these. So this is a pseudostratified columnar. I told you pseudostratified because it looks like there's multiple layers along, uh, on a histological slice, but in fact they're not. This little guy here is maybe ballooning out that way, and this one is coming in, like this one here is dipping back behind that one, etc. Um, and then there's transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium exclusively uh, exists, I believe it's exclusively, I think it's only in the uh, bladder. This is the epithelium that's in the bladder. And you can see the way this looks. Uh, what, what's a, what's a, what does your bladder do? It stores urine. And so what happens to your bladder? It's got, a tr it's got a stretch. 
I don't know. I ha I'll have to think what the epithelium is in the uterus. There may be transitional epithelium in the uterus. I'm, I'm embarrassed to not remember right now. But uh, in the bladder, there certainly is transitional epithelium. And uh, it, it's able to stretch uh, pretty remarkably and come back to its original shape. Yeah? This? No, the, the other two. Oh. No, the, down at the, bo the bottom two left. Okay, oh, it means these. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so a, a typical stratified squamous cell, uh, first thing you'll notice is that um, these really will look squamous. They are going to look m squished and spread out uh, much more so than these cuboidal ones. I know they kind of show this, like, half brick here, but that's, uh, that's not, they look like cubes when you, when you see them. Um, and then secondly, uh, there's going to be a lot more layers in a stratified, in a standard stratified epithelium versus a cuboidal. All right. On to glands. <coughs> So endocrine glands release hormones. Exocrine glands produce secretions. Okay? Uh, and they release their different products in different ways. Endocrine glands uh, release these hormones into interstitial fluid, just out into the broth, the, the, the cellular broth that they're sitting in, the interstitial fluid surrounding the cell. Uh, and there's never any ducts uh, produced uh, by endocrine tissue. On the other hand, uh, exocrine glands produce secretions that go out into ducts, into compartments that are going to transport uh, the, the secretions out onto the surface of an epithelium. All right? um, and there's three different types is merocrine, apocrine, and holocrine. We'll talk about uh, the distinction. And those, those three sort of represent a, a gradient, a kind of a gradient. Uh, little definition, secretion versus excretion. Uh, secretion is something we want, and excretion is something we don't. All right. <clears throat> Merocrine secretion happens in the Golgi uh, apparatus, and uh, the Golgi is that uh, convoluted stack of, you may remember throwing your mind back to biology class, that convoluted stack of uh, vesicular membrane um, in the, uh, towards the periphery of a cell. Uh, whatever secretions are being produced there uh, get packaged up into these vesicles which are then released uh, via the process of exocytosis that I uh, alluded to yesterday when I was talking about the role of calcium. So an example of merocrine secretion is sweat glands. Your sweat glands, uh, you produce sweat in the Golgi apparatus. Those vesicles balloon off of the Golgi, fuse with the plasma membrane, and release the fluid out into, onto the surface. Uh, and then it, where it evaporates off the surface of your skin, thus cooling your skin, all right? The, the primary purpose, there's a couple of purposes to sweat, but the primary purpose is to cool the body off. Uh, there's also, uh, with some types of sweat, you're trying to release uh, pheromones and what, you know, all kinds of different things. Uh, but the, the primary purpose is to cool the body down. Uh, so you'll notice in merocrine secretion, you're not losing any plasma membrane, meaning you're, you don't, those cells, uh, when you think biosynthetically about what those cells are making, what, they're, what, what kind of biomolecules, when I, you know, I was talking earlier, I just listed sugar, nucleic acid, proteins, and fats and lipids. Um, biosynthetically, what 
are those cells making and what are they not making? They're probably not making a whole lot of lipids, right? Because they're not turning over any, uh, they're, they're not releasing or, or losing any of its plasma membrane. The plasma membrane fuses, the, the vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane, which then gets recycled, uh, you know, and brought back down to the, the Golgi apparatus. I'm making this distinction because uh, <clears throat> it's contrasted with apocrine uh, secretion here. So apocrine secretion uh, also uh, happens in the Golgi. Uh, however, rather than exocytosis, that just the whole apical surface uh, below the adhesion belt in those um, cells just pinches off and gets released, just released out into the ductwork. An example of this is the mammary gland. Why? You tell me why it does it this way. Why do you think? Take a wild stab. Be bold. Guess. Nobody, nobody succeeds who doesn't dare. What do you think? Miss Bruce, you look at me. Caught your eye. What do you think? Just make it up. Um, maybe you can like, get more of it then? Maybe we can have a larger volume. Sure. Um, what else? Well, couldn't we, uh, if we wanted a higher volume, just couldn't, couldn't we uh, have a higher surface area and release more by exocytosis by fitting more cells into a smaller uh, volume? <coughs> Keep pushing it. What do you think? Um, it's, it's, it's a lot. Yes, yes, yeah, wow. Uh, don't you need like a lot of nutrients in the milk? Of course. So by pinching off uh, part of the membrane, you get kind of those effects. Exactly, precisely. That's, he's exactly right. So the baby needs fats. Fats are the highest energy density food that you can get. They need those fats to form brain cells. So when you have this apocrine sec uh, secretion, that baby isn't just getting the liquid, the fluid component, it's getting solid components as well. It's able to use that, uh, the lipids in that plasma membrane. Okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a way of further nutrifying uh, the baby. And then on the, other, on the, on the final end um, is the holocrine uh, secretion. So the contents of the cell get released by the cells bursting and dying. The cells basically explode. Um, and they get replaced from stem cells on the bottom of, of the layer. Uh, an example here is the sebaceous gland. The sebaceous gland. Why here? Why this? Why that? Oh, I'm sorry. A sebaceous gland would be a gland that you would find at the root of a hair, uh, maybe, that is, um, well, when I tell you what it is, you're, you, it's going to give the answer away. But it's, it's basically releasing oils uh, that, that coat and protect the hair and coat and protect your skin and, and, and help augment the impermeable barrier of, of the skin. So it's why, you know, your, your skin, uh, the, the keratinocytes that die and form the upper layer of your epithelium, um, they are kind of dry things. They're full of keratin. But if you coat them in sebum, it's why your skin feels supple rather than dry and, and, and flaky, hopefully, except here in the winter. I, I, I answered it there. Um, you know, these, these uh, cells in holocrine explode so they can coat the surface of the cell with all those cellular components, all those lipids and oils. They just pack themselves full of it. And um, the cells get rubbed off with time, too, don't they? You wear clothes, you wash your hands, you rub around, you get abraded by things. And all of that wax gets pulled off. So it's something where we're going to have to continuously be uh, recoding the surface with, with more of these. So we have this sort of um, this cycle. 
that is pushing in this direction, right? Whereas here, it's just we have the layer, it's protected in the mammary gland, we just need to release more uh, nutrients than uh, could be possible via maracrin secretion. So you understand the connection between structure and function here? It should be a nice, tight connection. All right, so this is really just a introduction to the different classifications of uh, the structures of these glands. Um, and, you know, discussing why each of these glands has evolved this shape uh, would take a long time. Going Almost uh, is like a medical school level histology class, maybe even not medical school, graduate school, or something like that. But um, I will just show you the pictures of them, the, the basic structures of them. So we have uh, tubular, coiled tubular, and branched tubular. Right? And then we have uh, these alveolar. And these are called simple because it's just a tube. It's just a tube. There's no cul-de-sac. There's no what we call an alveolus here. This is, this is a little pouch on the end, right? These are the tubulars, and these are the acinar. They, they secrete from a sac that has dilated out at the bottom of, of this tube, right? So we can have simple tubular, coiled tubular, and simple branch tubular, and then they can be alveolar or acinar. These two words, uh, in this case, are synonymous. So the, the simple, uh, and the branched alveolar. Um, and then we can get into these compound, uh, these compound glands. Uh, there's compound tubular, compound acinar, and compound tubulo alveolar. Man, any kind of combination you can think of, the body has used it to its advantage when the structure uh, warrants the necessary function. All right, that's all on epithelium. Does anyone have any questions about epithelium? We'll move on to connective tissue. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the, the lungs and the alveolus. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're covered with epithelium. Absolutely. We'll talk about all that when we get to the respiratory chapter. Yeah, I'm, so today I'm not talking about a specific... I actually hope to get to talk about the integument a little bit by the end, but I'm not talking about a specific organ system today. I'm talking about generali two generalized tissue categories, uh, epithelium and connective tissue. And I've told you that all these different organs and organ systems are combinations of different tissue types um, that, that will be found there. So I'm just laying the groundwork to move into a discussion of different organ systems one at a time. I talked about bones yesterday a little bit because I was trying to, uh, I was as a prelude to the, the or an example uh, of the concept of homeostasis. I was trying to use calcium homeostasis as a way to talk about bones or vice versa. But in general, um, I'm just setting the groundwork for a discussion of different uh, organ systems. So connective tissue, um, here are its functions. It binds organs together. Uh, this can happen uh, via tendons where we're attaching muscle to bone or uh, ligaments bone to bone. Um, it can also uh, help in terms of, for example, alveolar tissue that lays beneath uh, an epithelial layer and makes and connects the epidermis to the subdermis, for example. It, it's glue. It binds things together. It can, it can serve that function. Uh, some connective tissue uh, acts as support. These are the, the bones and the, and the cartilage. Um, and this 
of course, uh, can add protection when we are talking about the, the, all the functions of the skeletal system. Those are going to, uh, those functions are also going to fall under the, the uh, purview of the connective tissue. So the ribs, the cranium, the sternum, all of this, these bones here, protect the soft tissues uh, beneath them. We uh, humans have an endoskeleton. Uh, mammals have an endoskeleton. Arthropods have an exoskeleton, a hard thing on the outside that protects the soft tissues. But our hard structures are under layers of flesh um, and provide protection. So uh, white blood cells are considered to be connective tissue. Um, and this is the primary component of your immune system. So they provide protection against various pathogens, being bacteria or virus or uh, what have you, parasites. Uh, bones obviously help you uh, move, in providing a lever system. They act as storage, uh, fat, the, the adipocytes uh, store... Um, lipids for use. Also, the bones uh, act as a repository for calcium and phosphorus, and various inorganic salts. Uh, heat production. So, uh, for example, in a baby, there's two types of fats. There's uh, white and brown fat, that those cute, chubby rolls on a super sweet little baby. Um, those are not the same kind of fat uh, that your grandma may be looking at in the mirror when she goes into the shower. That is white fat versus brown fat. Babies have this brown fat. That's because that fat needs to turn over uh, rapidly, and it has many more mitochondria in it, which is why it's brown. Because of that, it's able to mobilize the, that adipose reserve really quickly. Does anybody have a much younger brother or sister? And you remember when they were real young, right? They were super chubby. Before they could walk, they were hopefully very chubby, and they had those cute rolls and stuff. And then suddenly they learn how to stand up, right? They pull themselves up and boom, all that fat goes away within the span of three months, right? Because they needed those calories. They had been storing them up by drinking as much of their mama's milk as they could. And then suddenly they needed to access all of that energy right away for the monumental task. It's, it, you think of what a baby was going through uh, it's kind of analogous to you learning how to fly. You know, they were, they were at first this wiggling mass of arms and legs, and then they suddenly learn how to pull themselves up and walk for the first time. It takes a huge amount of energy. And uh, so babies have brown fat. Uh, mobilizing that fat, burning all, all of uh, those calories uh, through the action of those mitochondria, that generates a lot of heat, which is good for babies. They want to stay warm. Um, all right, so the blood access transport uh, mechanism, and then the basal lamina uh, is formed by connective tissue, and this is what underlies uh, epithelial layers and connects epithelium to anything else in the body. This is what we call the lamina propria. Lamina propria. You can put that word in your memory banks because that will be used uh, in, in lab. The lamina propria. It's, it's the connective tissue that is forming uh, that, that basement, that layer beneath the basolateral surface of an epithelium and forms that helps to form that, that basement membrane. Okay. Uh, all right, so there are nine types of connective tissue uh, proper, nine, nine cell types. Um, so I told you there was uh, connective tissue proper, right? And then I said there was these specialized one, the, the support and the, trans and the fluid connective tissue. This is the specialized one. Here is the fluid and then the support. Uh, connective tissue, and then the connective tissue proper. Over here, uh, there, in, in this connective tissue proper, there's nine types of cells that are going to make up these different categories. The, the dense and the loose, the dense and the loose, 
each of which has these three categories within them. So those across the six different categories, there are nine different cell types that are going to make up this, uh, the proper CT. All right? So it can be a little bit confusing. There's a lot of cells to keep track of in CT. There's even more in e uh, epithelium, but we didn't even... That, that, that's higher, higher level stuff. So um, we're going to go through each of these types of cells. Because we're going to, as we talk about different organ systems, as we talk about different tissue, different structures, we're going to need to talk about some of these different connective tissue cells as they manifest themselves in these different contexts. First, fibroblasts. This is by far the most abundant cell type. Um, it's in all uh, proper connective tissue. You're going to find a fibroblast. Um, so they, they produce proteins, uh, and you might be able to guess that a fibroblast is, the protein is called fibrin. Um, that's one of the, the, the primary secretions is fibrin. Um, and then uh, also uh, hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronin is a, it's a glycoprotein, an acidic glycoprotein that uh, acts as cellular cement, uh, is, is the term I used right there. And then we see a little picture of these, these fibrocytes. Um, they're the kind of, I kind of think of them as uh, just the, the everyday Joe or Jolina construction workers out there in the body, uh, just taking care of building connective tissue, uh, keeping cells together, um, and helping connective tissue to make the connections and protections that it's supposed to. Fibrocytes. Uh, these are the second most abundant cell type. And these are also found in all connective tissue proper. Um, and th these are sort of the maintenance. So these ones here, oh God, that projector drives me crazy. This picture's horrible. These fibroblasts, are responsible for building new structures when they need to be built, and the fibrocytes are maintaining the structures. So yesterday I was talking about uh, a couple different cells that had similar suffixes. So what's a suffix? The end of the word. So uh, we talked about some cell types that were oblasts and some cells that were ocytes, didn't we? What were those? Osteoblasts. osteoblasts and osteocytes. What was the relationship between osteoblasts and osteocytes? Close. You're very close. You got half of that right. What do you think? Who, who say it again? What was your name? Hijun. Hijun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, wasn't osteocytes more like the mature? Osteoblasts are the ones that secrete. Osteoid. Yeah. And specifically, what was the, that? That's what each of them do. But what was the relationship between them? Uh, is it that the osteoblast matures into the osteocyte? That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Uh, the osteoblasts become osteocytes. All right, and and it's the same relationship here. So blast. The word blast. When you see that in a cell type, that it typically means that that cell is going to be some non-terminally differentiated cell. Some not, maybe not an embryonic cell type, a stem cell that is fully undifferentiated, but it's not terminally differentiated, right? It's going to become something else, or it can, could, has the potential to become something else. It's partially differentiated. It has a purpose in life. It's, it has a purpose in life, it, you know, but um, it hasn't uh, become a terminal purpose. So, for example, uh, Barack Obama was a senator for a while, and he could have stopped there and been a senator. Had a total function, you know, had, could have had a, a lovely life as a senator and lived out his entire life as that, but he decided to become president and so he sort of differentiated himself into this 
you know, after you become president, you, you really you just go on the book tour. You don't really get back, you don't go back into government again after that. Um, so it, it, it's, it's sort of like that. Fibrocyte is a, is a terminal, uh, is a terminal uh, state for these cells. All right. Adipocyte. Oh, and when you see that term ocyte rather than blast, that uh, ocyte means that that's a terminally differentiated cell, typically. Okay. So adipocyte. These are fat cells. Not a whole lot to say here. Uh, they store fat. Actually, they also um, produce hormones. I believe, is it leptin or ghrelin? Maybe both. I think it's leptin at least. Is produced in adipocytes. So there is endocrine function uh, in, in uh, fat tissue. Um, we'll move on. So that's, that's these guys right here. I, I promise, I, maybe it's annoying me more than you guys, I promise to get a better screen, a bulb. Mesenchymal cells. Um, these are stem cells that uh, get turned on when there's some sort of injury uh, to, or infection or some sort of like disruption of the status quo. Um, they, these mesenchymal cells are the ones that become fibroblasts. Uh, they can also become macrophages and a whole host of other uh, connective tissue cells. They are um, less differentiated uh, than, than um, many of the other connective t tissue cells. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, maybe. I, you know, I feel stupid. I wasn't able to figure this out as well as I would have liked. Does that work better for you guys? Is that going to put? I, I know some of you guys are a little sleepy today. Um, is that going to put you to sleep? Can you handle that? Is that better? Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Um, so, if you wanted a fibrocyte, you could start at mesenchymal cell and then go to fibroblast and go to fibrocyte. For example, that's one of the one of the pathways, right? Um, all right. So macrophages. Macrophages are amazing. Sometime when you're, you have nothing to do and the internet is in front of you, which um, probably is not as often as uh, you would like, but uh, when that happens to you, look up a video of a macrophage. Just go to YouTube and, and look for macrophage and, and click around until you find a cool one. You'll find these, these high-resolution videos of macrophages doing their thing. They are crazy alien creatures that are keeping you safe. They're amazing, amazing amoeba-like cells uh, that have become part of the immune system. They seek out pathogens, they seek out debris, uh, damaged cells, cells that have been targeted for destruction, and they send their tendrils out, surround them, uh, and absorb them. Uh, there's a couple different categories of mac macrophages, uh, and within those categories there are other subtypes, uh, but there are, are, in general, fixed macrophages that just stay where they are. You just, and if something comes along, it absorbs it. And then there are freely roaming uh, macrophages who go out and find uh, what they are they are going to recycle. All right, mast cells. Uh, the, the primary job of mast cells is to set off an alarm, okay? Um, they release a variety of uh, chemical signals that are going to stimulate some sort of reaction in the body, some sort of reaction, often a positive feedback uh, reaction. So uh, some of these compounds are histamine. Uh, histamine is, is a, a chemoattractant. Uh, it, it can uh, recruit 
different components from the immune system, different white blood cells to a region. When a mast cell shows up somewhere, it's like, oh my God, there's a problem. Boom, release histamine. Everybody else comes in because there's now an infection. And this is what uh, starts the erythema of like the redness around a, uh, an infection. The, it starts uh, vasodilation, brings in red blood, uh, brings in blood flow, uh, capillary blood flow to the area, allows uh, white blood cells to get on site, allows for extravasation, it affects the epithelial cells. Histamine has a lot of, of, uh, of functions. Heparin. Heparin is uh, important in the clotting cascade when you injure yourself. Right, and can be released by uh, mast cells that are on site when you get uh, injured at that point um, and starts the very complicated process of, of uh, hemostasis or, or, or clotting. Uh, there, there are some other white blood cells that also uh, have histamine and he heparin. These are basophils, which we will talk about in lab. They're actually kind of rare. Um, and then, uh, yeah, these are a, a type of leukocyte um, that, that you'll learn to recognize in lab. Uh, lymphocytes. Um, so I, I just mentioned cells, uh, basophils. These are a category of uh, immune cells um, that are found in the lymphatic tissue. Um, and they produce antibodies. So, for example, T cells and B cells uh, would be uh, types of, of lymphocytes. And within that uh, T cell, there's like so many categories. I don't know what Miss uh, Dr. Hannum talks about in her class. She's got an immunology class here, but um, I'm, I'm sure she could spend her whole semester talking about just lymphocytes. Um, so... Uh, they produce antibodies, and um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. It's an interesting topic. Microphages, related to macrophages, but macro means large, micro means little. That there's uh, one sort of morphological distinction between them. They are also phagocytic cells. What does phage mean? P H A G E. What does that mean? Where, where else do you see uh, PHAG in an anatomical structure? EU PHAG, the esophagus, right? Uh, U, EU means true, phage means to eat, all right? The esophagus is the true eating tube. They call it the esophagus because it's not the pharynx. The pharynx is the shared part of the back of the throat where air that goes into the trachea and food, which goes into your stomach, passes through. But once it gets past the larynx, it goes into the esophagus or the true eating tube because nothing goes down the esophagus that shouldn't be consumed. All right? Phage means to eat something, to consume something. So uh, a microphage, is, so a phagocytic cell is a cell that eats other cells, eats things, a phagocyte. Uh, and a microphage is a type of, of phagocytic blood cell. Um, and it responds to chemical signals put out by the mast cells. Uh, maybe the, the, the uh, heparin or the, uh, the heparin sulfate or the uh, histamine. Uh, or macrophages can also stimulate microphages. Um, there's a lot of different examples of microphages. Uh, such as eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils. Um, these are types of leukocytes, gr granular leukocytes. Yep. Um, what do these cells eat exactly? What do you, what do you got to feed them? Um, bacteria, cells that have been uh, irreversibly compromised for some reason. Maybe they have cancer. They're, they've been targeted as cancer, cancerous cells. I forget what the number is, but something like one, one trillion. No, I'm sorry. I mean million. One million cells in your body a day uh, become 
cancerous and your body has to deal with that uh, and eat those cells. Um, cells that go apoptotic for some reason. Uh, so, you know, there's all kinds of things. Maybe it's a parasite and the parasite has been neutralized by the body and it's been broken down and it has to absorb it. It's all kinds of stuff, just foreign, foreign bodies that get in the, in, in the body. A anything, really. Cellular debris. Yeah. Um, just to close out uh, back to uh, macrophages. Oh, uh, yeah, where were we? Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, so is there a distribution difference in particular regions of the body based on who you can find? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's going to be tissue-specific requirements uh, for macrophages and, and uh, different fixed or free macrophages. Um, yeah, I'm, I don't want to get into a lot of the details of that, but the answer is yes. There, there are tissue-specific uh, requirements. We'll, we'll revisit that a little bit. Like, for example, when we talk about the uh, nervous system, there's this blood-brain barrier that doesn't really allow uh, things to pass very easily, uh, that blood-brain barrier. So there's, there's going to be uh, instances where a, a, a fixed macrophage is that is resident in uh, in the nervous system. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, eosinophils, neutrophils, basophils. I won't talk about those because we'll talk about that in lab and in and in when I talk about blood more. Melanocytes. These are cells uh, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, Sarah, right? Yes. Um, for the example of the macrophages, um, they hand in. Yeah, 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 that's right. So uh, <clears throat> the, the fill is referring to, so the name eosinophil, neutrophil, and basophil uh, is, those names come because of histological um, uh, nuances. So for example, eosinophils, uh, these are the ones that make IgE antibodies, uh, and an eosinophil is uh, recognized, uh, here is one, God. here is one, <laughs> that uh, is recognized histologically because it absorbs eosin dye. Eosin is, is, a, is a cell marking dye. Um, and Phil, uh, so for example, like an audiophile is a person that likes music, right? Or Phil me just means, P-H-I-L, it means um, uh, affinity for something, to like something, to adhere to something. So those, uh, those designations, Phil on the back, uh, are just referring, those are like histological artifacts of what the first people that were identifying them before they knew exactly what they were doing, they were um, they they were able to recognize these cells and gave them certain names based upon their histological uh, designation. So you can say that these eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils, because they have this this term on the back, that they're you know phagocytes or the, 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 what they are called is. Uh, Granular leukocytes is, is the category that they actually are, but that falls within the, the broader category of, of microphages. Um, not all microphages are going to be, uh, have that fill distinction on the back. Um, I'd have to think about whether there's a cell type that has a fill on the back that's not a microphage. There might be. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that as a hard and fast rule. Um, okay, melanocytes. They produce melanin. So here's, here's an example. Um, melanin is a, a chromophore. Uh, it's a brown pigment in the skin that helps protect the delicate uh, cells beneath your body from the harmful effects of UV radiation. It absorbs that UV radiation. Um, all right, connective tissue fibers. These are the different types of cell products that some con connective tissues make. Uh, it can make collagen. This is a common, straight, unbranched. Um, you can think of a collagen fiber as being a like a steel cable, like a, a thick, uh, 
steel cable that resists force along its long axis, okay? Uh, reticular fibers, a reticular, uh, anything that's reticulated, a reticule is something that is branched or, or patterned like a network. So a reticulated fiber, uh, collagen is just like this. Right? It's you get a long, unbranched thing that's just, it's just we need a connection between here and here. Uh, a reticulated fiber is, may look like this, and is going to resist force in all of these directions. Okay? Um, and then elastic fibers. Uh, the thing about an elastic fiber, it's going to look like this. It's not going to be as reticulated as reticulated fiber. Uh, but there will be some branches uh, in it. And the thing about it is it's stretchy, as the name would, would lead you to believe, that it's a little bit stretchy. So learning how to identify those uh, is going to be something that you'll need to do in the lab. All right, so here's just a, cr a cartoon showing ground substance. Ground substance. This is just... Um, a clear, viscous, sort of like the jello uh, that exists between cells a little bit, all right? Um, so it's very viscous, meaning it, it flows slowly like honey, um, and uh, it is full of different connective tissue cells, which are all making these different cell products collagen, elastic fibers, uh, reticulated fibers, depending upon the, the tissue, uh, the organ-level tissue that it's finding itself in. All right? So some of these other compounds that you'll find there are these glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, other adhesive glycoproteins, a lot of glyco in there. Um, we'll talk about that. So in this cartoon, this is just a total fictitious cartoon trying to schematize it for you. We have, uh, you know, fibroblasts here, probably making fibrin. Here's some fat cells. Uh, it's just showing all the, how all the different types of connective tissue cells can exist, uh, possibly in some tissue. Yeah. Your name was uh, Mara. Mara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it all just in ground substance, or is that like just like? A... Say that again. Do like all of those types exist in ground substance? No, they don't all have to type. Existing ground substance, and there, it's just the ground substance is the, sort of the interstitial goo that you would find in in one kind of connective tissue or another. Honestly, mostly found. If I were to guess what that most looks like, it most looks like uh, areolar tissue, which we'll talk about in a moment. I'm not going as fast as I had hoped. So I am a uh, my. I went to medical school for two years while I was in graduate school, which is why I'm able to teach this class. But uh, I have a PhD in, in, in biophysics. Specifically, I studied carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrate biophysics. So uh, th this is a, a field here uh, that I, I have particular interest in. Um, this is talking about, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different components that you would find in ground substance. Okay. So uh, these glycosaminoglycans, glycosaminoglycans, or GADs, um, we have a couple different important uh, ones, chondroitin sulfate and hyaluronic acid. One of the things that, uh, that all these GAGs have in, and I've, I've never, I've always wanted to make a joke up about it being called a GAG, but I've never, it's never actually occurred to me what that might be. Um, they're very abundant, uh, both the chondroitin and the hyaluronic acid. One of the things that they have in uh, common is that they tend to be highly anionically charged. They ha they're acidic, and because of that, uh, they, when they're the conjugate base, when they've been ionized, because they're, they're acidic, uh, we have a lot of anionic charge. You guys have all had chemistry, I assume. Um, so you can see that the negative charges on the chondroitin sulfate, the keratin sulfate, on the high hyaluronic acid. This is uronic acid. This is uh, gluconac and acetyl glucosamine. Um, yeah, so uh, chondroitin sulfate 
is uh, found in a lot of collagen and gives collagen its, uh, its stiffness, its strength, but also allows it to bend, unlike bone. You haven't laid all of that uh, ceramic hydroxyapatite down in the matrix uh, like bone has in its, in its osteoid matrix. But uh, it has all this chondroitin sulfate uh, that allows uh, cartilage to be stiff, but, but forgiving, but uh, bending a little bit. Hyaluronic acid is uh, extremely slippery. It's extremely slippery. Um, and cartilage is, too, not as uh, slippery as the uh, synovial fluid. So this hyaluronic acid acts as a joint lubricant in the synovial fluid in the bursa that surround joints uh, and the synovial membranes. Uh, it's also in the vitreous body of the eyeball. Uh, did anybody ever in like high school biology class cut open a cow's eyeball or something? And so there's this big, clear jelly ball in the middle of your eyeball, and that's called the vitreous body. Uh, that's made of hyaluronic acid as well. It's these negative charges that um, enable uh, hyaluronic acid to slip over itself. The negative charges do not want to interact with each other. They repel each other, but it's loaded with negative charges. So um, because it it's, wants to stay away from the other negative charges, they end up sliding over one another really easily. They don't, they don't uh, get in and, and adhere to one another. Does that make sense? Um, oh, I used to have a lot more about that, but I cut it out. So uh, dense connective tissue. Um, there's dense regular and there's dense irregular. Dense regular connective tissue. These are tendons. It's basically long, uh, parallel fibers of collagen that are really strong in, in this direction. You could split a tendon apart. You could tease it apart really easily along this direction, but you don't need to because the tendon, it's, it's never a problem because the tendon isn't having force applied along uh, this dimension. It's uh, the, the, the perpendicular dimension. It's always uh, the, it's strong parallel to the direction of fibers, as you may imagine. Um. <clears throat> We do have elastic fibers in there, which gives it a little bit of stretch uh, because when you put a lot of force really quickly on a tendon, you don't want it to snap, right? You want it to have a little bit of give, uh, but you also want it to be very strong. Uh, then there's dense irregular connective tissue. We find this in the uh, subdermis below the skin. This is real dense connective tissue down there. Um, that is able to withstand a lot of stress, uh, or a moderate amount of stress at least, from a number of different directions. Um, all right. And then there's elastic tissue, the third type of dense CT. Uh, and this is mostly made of elastin. An example of this would be um, the transverse ligaments in the vertebra that are able to stretch and then come back, which enables your vertebra column to stay nice and aligned, but allows your back to, to do all the, your spine to do all this, this motion with respect to one another. Uh, now on to the three types of loose CT. They're areolar tissue. Areolar tissue is really stretchy stuff. It's really stretchy stuff. It's what lays, the bulk of your dermis is, uh, is areolar tissue, um, and which is why you can take your skin and, and do this to it and let it go and it comes back to shape. It's really stretchy but strong, has a lot of elastic fibers in it as you'll see. Uh, it gets its name, I believe it gets its name from uh, the areola of the breast, if you've ever uh, watched anybody breastfeeding before, um, a, a woman's breast is, you know, babies are not always 
the nicest to their mothers when they're young and learning to feed. They, it's really stretchy uh, tissue. So I, I believe, and that there's certainly a lot of areolar tissue in, in, uh, in an areola. And I, I believe that's where it gets its name from. Um, but it's all over the place. Areolar tissue is throughout the body. All right. Uh, next is reticular tissue. Uh, the second type of loose connective tissue. Um, and it's highly enriched in reticular fibers, reticulated fibers. It's just this broad meshwork of uh, broad meshwork of reticulated fibers that can form, uh, often forms what's called a stroma. And a stroma is a um, Sort of like the case of a uh, an organ, like the there is a reticulated fibers or a stroma to the kidneys, or all of your lymph nodes have reticular fiber that give just like an overall shape to the outside of an organ. And the spleen, the thymus, the bone marrow. There's different places where you can find this reticular tissue. All right, adipose tissue, the third type. Uh, and so we talked about white fat. Um, this is everybody here. Ha whatever fat you have is white fat. Uh, it stores energy, absorbs shock, and allows your body to, uh, to conserve heat. Brown fat is much more vascularized because you need to mobilize that energy as quickly as you can. Uh, it has many, many mitochondria, as I said before. And, um, and it's, but it's found exclusively in babies like my daughter there. All right. Uh, then the supporting connective tissues. Um, got 20 minutes left. I, I don't want to, I've talked about bone uh, yesterday. I don't want to get too much into it now. Uh, one thing that I want, uh, I guess a point to make out here is do you know any sayings about bones? Like ones that your grandpa might have pulled out when he was talking about a drought in the summer. He's walking through his, his, his field, his garden. He says, oh, this dirt. It's dry as a bone. Oh, and you just say, grandpa, no. Bones are not dry. Bones are highly vascularized. You mean dry as cartilage. That's what you want to say to him. Because bones are richly invested with blood vessels. Cartilage, on the other hand, is totally avascular. Uh, not totally. There is some cartilage that's a little bit vascularized. But by and large, it's avascular. Why do you think, knowing what you already know in class, why do you think it's a good thing that bone is highly vascular? What do we talk about bone? What is one of the functions of bone? It's where you make new blood cells. It's where you make new blood cells. Yeah, absolutely. What else? That's one, and you got it. There's, we're going to add another one to the list. What else? Protection, we're not going to add that to the list. You're correct. I'm looking for one that is going to explain why we want a lot of blood there. Yeah? Uh, it's because of the calcium. Uh... Got it. Yeah. So both the production of red blood cells and its function as a storage of calcium and phosphate, that stuff, there needs to be intimate exchange between the bone and the blood. All right? needs to be intimate exchange between the bone and the blood. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's our primary repository for calcium, which we've already established is an extremely important uh, electrolyte in your body. Um, because of this now, which of these injuries heals faster, heals easier? A bone injury or a cartilage injury? Bone. Why? I, you already, I, yep, say it. You got it. Uh, 
That's it. Exactly. Exactly. It's much easier to get nutrients into bone. Cartilage heals much more slowly. The nutrients that are getting into cartilage come in through diffusion. They have to diffuse into cartilage. That's why it's extremely important at your point in life going forward to be thinking about soft tissue health in your body, cartilage health. Be nice to your cartilage. How? With diet, by remaining appropriately hydrated, not overhydrated, but not certainly not dehydrated, and uh, getting the, the right kind of supported compression and extension on that soft tissue to help it absorb its nutrients. When you, so I, I do yoga, right? Uh, one of the reasons I do that is because when you squeeze, in, not in an acute way that's going to damage the cartilage, but when you squeeze, compress cartilage, you're squeezing stuff out of it. It looks like a sponge. There's all these holes in it. You're squeezing stuff out of the cartilage. Then when you're stretching cartilage, you're sucking things into the cartilage. So that repetitive, slow, supported compression and extension of cartilage creates this pumping action that helps the chondrocytes get what they need. Get what they need to repair damaged cartilage, to stay healthy. All right? It's, it's important. That, that kind of activity. You need to do the, like, you know, whatever kind of aerobic exercise for your heart and your blood chemistry and your brain and whatever, all that stuff. But stretching, uh, and, like supported stretching, yoga, uh, there's a lot of different other ways you can do that sort of thing that are, is going to help your soft tissue. And it's something to think about now because when you get older, Yes, osteoporosis is a problem, but honestly, it's cartilage, soft tissue problems that are a bigger problem uh, in geriatric medicine than anything else. The people who have hip replacements and knee replacements and arthritis. Okay, I go on too many di diversions. Cartilage matrix. This matrix is made of different proteoglycans uh, that comes from the chondroitin sulfate that I showed you earlier. And there's various uh, ground substance proteins that are there, like the collagen, like the elastin. Uh, when I say collagen, you know, all, everything I say uh, when I talk about a certain type of thing in a class like this tends to be in generalities. There are, there's a long list of different types of collagen your body makes. Your body has, I don't know, like 21, something like that, different collagen genes that are going to be expressed in different cell types that are doing different things depending upon the tissue that those cells that are expressing those genes find themselves. <clears throat> so there's a host of different uh, uh, ground substance proteins that can be found in the cartilage matrix slightly different depending upon what type of cartilage it is. There's a, there's a bunch of different types of cartilage. Um, chondrocyte is a cartilage cell. Uh, it's surrounded by this lacunae. The word lacuna, or lacunae, uh, plural, is ju it's just a, a compartment. It means a chamber. It means a hollow. A lacuna is a hollow of some sort. And th that's a generalized term. Here, it's the space uh, so here would be a lacuna with, with a couple chondrocytes living in it, all right? And surrounding it, all of this here, all of this pink stuff is uh, the, the, the matrix, the cartilage, cartilage matrix. On the edge, over here and over here, is this Parachondrium. This is a cellular layer uh, where we're going to have chondroblasts living. Um, the partially differentiated uh, cartilage cells. This is giving it some protective strength and is a reservoir for new cartilage. Uh, uh, the, the growth happens along the edge of the parachondrium. All right. So... Uh, we're gonna, Skip that. 
So cartilage is avascular. We hit that one pretty hard already. Uh, here's one type of supportive connective tissue, hyaline cartilage. It's this clear, glassy uh, material that's the most common uh, form of cartilage. You can see it. Um, yeah, it has very, very fine fibers. The, ma the matrix of hyaline car cartilage is very fine and hard to identify the individual fibers. Um, and it usually has perichondrium on whatever border you're going to see in the hyaline cartilage. Uh, we find this all over the cell, uh, the body. So the, the fetal skeleton is entirely made out of hyaline cartilage. You then may guess that hyaline cartilage is part of the transition to bone. So cartilage becomes ossified and becomes bone uh, in, the, in the infant. Uh, the larynx, uh, your, your, your trachea, the tracheal cartilages, uh, the costal cartilage, this stuff down here that you can feel, that's all uh, hyaline. Articular cartilage all over the place in your, in your joints, it's all hyaline. All right. So next is elastic cartilage. Uh, so elastic cartilage has less matrix than hyaline cartilage. Uh, and it has uh, more elastic fibers. Um, you can find this in the, the ear here. So you can see that your ribs don't bend quite the same way as your ear does, do they? And your epiglottis, that flap that goes down in the back of your throat that you're probably completely unaware of when you swallow, that, that springy flap inside your mouth is also made of, or in the back of your throat, is also made of... Uh, of elastic cartilage. And the third type here is fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is really strong. It has a lot of fibrin that lays down in this annular uh, pattern. I should probably put a picture of that in. Um, you find this in the, uh, the intervertebral discs. You find it in the pubic symphysis. So your pelvis is really uh, is, is broken into two sides, right? There's, there's two sides to your pelvis, and they're joined at the pubic symphysis down the midline um, by, by some uh, fibrocartilage. The meniscus uh, in your knee, those are, so like part of the cup on the, on the lower, on the tibia that the, that the femur sits into, that's made of fibrocartilage. Very strong, uh, very strong cartilage. Again, Large letters at the top, avascular. Fluid connective tissues. Blood, lymph, carries various specific cell types, formed elements, uh, red, white uh, blood cells, and platelets. Um, I'm going to sort of flash through this because I'm going to come back to this in the cardiac, uh, in, in the cardiovascular chapter. We'll talk about this again. Um, I'm going to kind of flash through it because I'm I want to get to a couple concepts before I run out of time. Uh, membrane. This is important. This is one of the, the take-home messages here. And I said it at the beginning of the, the, the session, and I'll say it again here. A membrane, a tissue membrane, a tissue membrane, not a cellular membrane, but a tissue membrane, is epithelium supported by connective tissue. You can think of it just like this, ET over CT, all right? Epithelium over CT, connective tissue, equals a tissue membrane. That's what a tissue membrane is. There's four types. There's mucous membranes, and we'll talk about them each. Mucous membranes found in, on the mucosa, in the mouth, in uh, the digestive tract, in the nasal passages, in the vagina. Uh, throughout the body, wherever you make mucus. Uh, serous membranes. We talked about serous membranes yesterday in the lab. The three types, the pericardium, the pleura, and the peritoneum. Synovial membranes. Synovial membranes are part of joint capsules around the knee, in the palm, in the elbow, in the shoulder, in the hip. Synovial membranes make uh, synovial fluid uh, that allows surfaces to slide over one another. And then finally, the fourth type 
of tissue membrane is the cutaneous membrane, your skin. All right. So uh, mucous membranes line passages that have external connections. So I, I listed the, those places, the urinary. I, I had left that one out. Um, these epithelial cell surfaces that are exposed to the, the outside world, they must be moist um, because you want them to reduce friction. You don't want to have your, your walnut and lentil burger that you had for lunch passing through your gut and, you're, and to, to feel like it's going down a, a dry, sandy intestine. That doesn't sound a comfortable way to digest your food. It needs to, things need to slide across themselves. Um, all right. And it also helps the uh, nutrients, for example, in the gut, it helps the nutrients that are being liberated by the process of digestion to be dissolved, to dissolve into that mucus so that you can then absorb it properly. Okay. Um, we use this word already, lamina propria. Lamina propria is the connective tissue part of this membrane. It's the connective tissue part of the membranes. It's laying beneath uh, the epithelial layer, and it's made of areolar tissue in mucous membranes. Serous membranes. Uh, we talked about this in lab. Uh, is there anything new on this slide? Yeah, well, they make, they make these fluid transudates, which help reduce the friction, right? Um, and we talked about parietal and visceral. They, this fluid that they make is called a transudate. It's called a transudate. The epithelium is... is uh, is actually a mesothelial derived epithelial cell type and it makes this uh, transudate which is the slippery uh, surface that happens within this space right here this airspace there's going to be a little bit of transudate in a person who has congestive heart failure for example uh, this pericardial sac is is become too full of transudate and uh, there's too much fluid pressure in here, thus it's putting pressure on the heart and preventing the, the blood pressure uh, that's able to pass through these uh, arteries supplying the heart is not able to work against the fluid pressure of the transudate in that pericardial cavity, okay? Uh, and we call that congestive heart failure. We talked about these three yesterday, the pleura, the peritoneum, and the pericardium. So this is uh, the remarkable new uh, organ that I, I'm making fun of. Uh, but it's, it's the, uh, the, the, the uh, really just layers of the peritoneum that have folded over and uh, become the mesentery, where the mesenteric arteries pass. All right, synovium, joint capsules. I've already talked about this. Uh, is there anything new in here? So they, they say that it uh, lacks a true epithelium, and this is because uh, the epithelial layer is not absolutely contiguous over the entire expanse of that synovial membrane. All right, there are patches of epithelium but uh, they're, not, they're not totally contiguous over the surface. And then underneath it is all this areolar tissue that's going to have uh, the capillaries and venules uh, that are needed to supply the tissue. Inside this space, then, this is called, uh, this, this is the synovial space or the bursal sac, and you have synovial fluid filling that joint, helping to cushion, uh, helping to cushion the two bones and the articular cartilage, providing nutrients. The synovium is a nutrient broth that will serve the avascular cartilage. All right, and then finally the cutaneous membrane, the skin. 
Um, I don't have a whole lot of time left, but I'm going to say a few things about connective tissue, or, or the skin in a moment. Fascia, I'll just give you the uh, definition of the word. Fascia is simply a connective tissue framework that helps different uh, tissue layers of the body stay adhered to one another. So for example, we have uh, intercostal muscles and then some obliques uh, in the body wall, and in between them are these layers of, of fascia. Uh, and, and you can describe them based upon where they are. There's the superficial, the deep, and some sub serosa fascia that's laying uh, below the, uh, the peritoneum on the body, interior body wall. All right. So that was that. This, I am obviously not going to be able to talk about all this in the next uh, few minutes. But this is the skin. This is uh, the integument. And what am I going to talk about here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick and choose a few things. We're not, I'm not going to talk about hair. I'm not going to talk about nails. And probably won't talk about any of the pathology. But uh, I will talk about the actual skin a little bit. The skin is huge. It's the largest system in the body. 15% of your weight is actually tied up in your skin. Uh, and it it's, has a, a fairly substantial surface area of two square meters. Um, it's made up of the cutaneous membrane and then various accessory structures. Uh, we have two types of skin, thick skin and thin skin. Thick skin does not have hair in it, and it has an extra layer. Uh, it has an extra layer in um, in the epidermal uh, layer. Thin skin does have hair uh, and uh, these ceruminous glands, etc. So even though this guy's back looks like he might have a kind of thick-skinned back, uh, obviously with all that hair, this is thin skin. Uh, all of the thick skin in your body is exclusively found on the, the, the palms and soles of your feet. All right. Oh, man, I forgot that picture was in there. <laughs> yeah, it's been a crazy year. This was, I made this slide like four years ago before I ever thought this dude would be president. Um, right, so what does the skin do? It has all these functions. Hot and cold protection, UV protection, water barrier, mechanical and chemical protection, absorption, uh, a, a, a barrier to various pathogens, uh, thermal regulation and sensation. But the point I'm making with this thing up here is that it is also used for the expression of emotions. So you can use the skin uh, of, the, of the face to help uh, convey meaning. Anywhere from 80 to 100% of the D3 that uh, you need in your body uh, comes from, and we talked about that yesterday in terms of calcium regulation, comes from, ex uh, uh, comes from exposure to the sun. The cholecalciferol is produced uh, from vitamin D3. All right. Epidermis is avascular, stratified, um, and the nutrients that serve the epidermis diffuse from uh, capillaries in the dermis. Is anybody a James Bond fan? Watch any of those old James Bond movies. This is a picture from Goldfinger. I remember watching that when I was a kid and thinking, whoa, she died. She was coated in, in gold paint. Well, uh, they used to believe that your skin uh, got its nutrients and air by diffusing in from the outside. And this uh, woman in this story apparently died because she got painted in gold paint and, her, and she was suffocated because she wasn't able to get enough uh, oxygen into her body. That is absolutely fictitious. Uh, that is not true whatsoever. The, the oxygen comes in through uh, the, the dermis. In that picture, apparently, they, they so totally believed this fallacy at the time, this was in the 60s, that in this picture, the, uh, for this thing, they didn't want the woman to actually die. 
So they left a, a patch of skin on her butt that didn't have any gold paint on it. Um, this is kind of a bizarre story. Uh, thankfully, we, we understand how the body works a little better than back then. Thankfully, a lot of things are different than back then. <laughs> um, all right, the epidermis. What am I going to say here? The epidermis is this avascular layer on the surface of the skin. It has all these different layers, which I'm not going to take the time to go through now because I'm essentially out of time. Um, yeah. Uh, the life history of a keratinocyte. I apologize for uh, I, talking so much early on and not timing myself well. I'm going to skip all this stuff. Where are we going to go? I'm going to say this one thing. The hypodermis. So um, the hypodermis is the area beneath the dermis, uh, which is uh, either the dermis or the hypodermis. These are where uh, you're going to get injections. So when you're giving a hypodermic injection, uh, you're, you're looking uh, for that subcutaneous, subcutaneous uh, area below uh, the dermis. Skin color. Unfortunately, I'm not going to get a chance. The point I'll make here is this is kind of interesting that uh, people think that uh, people with dark skin have more melanocytes than people with light skin. This is actually not true. Uh, people with uh, dark skin and light skin have essentially the same skin. Their skin is. Uh, precisely the same. They have the same number of melanocytes. It's just that if you have darker skin, those melanocytes are producing more melanin. It's the amount of melanin that's getting produced by uh, the existing uh, melanocytes. It's not the melanocyte density itself. Um, uh, this is some pathology. I'm not going to go through burn stuff. I wasn't going to go through that. Don't, don't get sunburns, uh, skin cancer. I'm not going to talk about any of those. This one's kind of an interesting thing. This will be the last thing I talk about. Um, so I used to work at this camp. I'm sorry to put up such a horrible picture, uh, but it's, it's important to know uh, what, what is out there, what the skin does for yourself. I used to work at a, at a camp for children with chronic skin disease uh, run by the American Academy of Dermatology uh, for many years. And... Uh, there were students, there were children there with all sorts of skin disorders. Uh, everything from, you know, e severe eczema, but eczema, you know, and psoriasis, which can also be very severe, through all kinds of ichthyoses and whatever, uh, over to people like this. And this disease is called uh, epidermolysis bullosa. There's a host of different epidermolysis bullosas. Um, this one in particular, RDEB, is one of the most severe. The RDEB and junctional uh, are, are two of the most severe uh, types of, of epidermal lysis bullosa, or EB. It's a mutation in the collagen 7 gene, uh, an isotype of the collagen 7, coll uh, collagen 7A1. And this is the collagen that is in the areolar tissue of, of the integument. Okay, um, and so what happens here is any kind of shear force, like if you were to take one of these people's hands and go like this, like the, the, the simplest of human gestures, uh, take their hand and go like this, that pressure, that shear force would separate the, uh, the epidermis and the dermis and, and because there's no strength there uh, any longer because of the, the malformed collagen and a blister would form. That blister, the fluid, you, we've all had blisters, I'm sure. That blister that has a fluid pressure in it. That fluid pressure in you, it just, it's just a blister, right? It just stays there. In a, in a person with RDEB, that the fluid pressure causes the blister to spread out and become larger and larger and larger. There's nothing to stop the spread of these blisters. So oftentimes these people, 80% of their body at a given time is either blistered or healing from uh, a, a blister. And it's not just on their skin. It happens in, on their, in their mouth, their whole GI tract, their eyes even. Um, and because their body is, 
is being scarred and re. Sorry, I just, just got hit by a wave of emotion. Um, their hands, uh, uh, because there, there's so much scar tissue, their fingers curl up and get scarred over into these mitts, like you see here. Uh, <clears throat> this is a it's a it's a truly mind-boggling disease. Uh, the people cannot eat solid food. They have to be on a liquid diet their entire life uh, because uh, of the damage to their GI tract. Because they've never eaten solid food, the, their rectal uh, tonus is gone, so they have to wear diapers uh, their entire life. They'd never take any solid bowel movements, um, and which can be uh, a, a problem for them because they're wearing diapers. Their body is, there's wounds all over their body, and then they're sitting in a diaper that uh, it, you know is full of their excrement. Um, it, it, they, these people have major infection problems, as you may uh, imagine. Often they are uh, they're very prone to skin cancer, uh, and a lot of them are morphine addicts because of the excruciating pain that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so this is a story of uh, this young woman. Her name is Jamie Hartley. Sorry, <clears throat> pardon me, I, I didn't uh, anticipate. She was one of the counselors at uh, this camp. Um, and I met her many years ago. She was a Mormon woman uh, living in Utah. She had a very beautiful voice. She was an excellent singer, truly excellent singer. And you may say, wow, she doesn't look as, as bad as this, this person here. That, that is testament to the exquisite care uh, that was given to her by uh, people in the Mormon community. And eventually her husband, she married uh, some man who, took, who just absolutely dedicated himself to caring for her. She was a, a phenomenally remarkable individual. Um, when I knew her, she was the oldest living person with uh, re recessive dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. Uh, she, she actually died in this past year. Um, she made it to, what was it, 34, something like that. Um, so it, it, it was sad. To, we, I was sad to, to lose a friend uh, in, in Jamie. Um, I'll tell one other story. I know I'm, I'm really over, and I hate doing that to you, but I still have you. I'm just eating into lab time. Um, this, is, this is an interesting story. Uh, there was a, a boy at the camp named Justin Cross, and he uh, had not RDEB. He had a, a type called junctional, a very severe, very, very severe case. And these people need to have, ideally, they need to have uh, a bandage change every day, at least one uh, bandage change every day. It doesn't happen to all of them. There are some people, families that are born with, that have children born into them that just don't have the wherewithal to manage this problem. Um, but uh, Justin ne needed a bandage change. And I was, it was the I was gonna do it for him. It was the first time I'd ever done a bandage change on a patient like that before. And I have to say, I was scared shitless. It was, it was a really frightening experience for me. Um, the way you do it is you take the, the person and you, and you soak them in the bathtub first. It starts off with a body temperature bath uh, and to allow the bandages, even with Telfa, these non-stick bandages, and these, body, these people's skin is a mess, right? And so it takes a long time for that bandage to kind of, you know, to soak so that you can remove it from their body. Um, and I'm doing this, I've soaked him, and I have, I have him there in the tub, and, I, and I'm starting to try to unwrap these bandages from his body. He had blue, beautiful blue eyes. Um, and I remember him wincing. He just, it, was, it was painful. It was very painful to him. And I was just shaking, right? I was, I was totally afraid of, of hurting this person, like, you know, trying to help him. And, and he stopped me. It was so remarkable. He's a 12-year-old boy. He just said, Tom, don't be afraid. This whole thing hurts. It's going to hurt me. 
But don't be afraid of that. I know it's going to hurt. I'm not afraid of it. Uh, don't you be afraid of it. Just, just do what you know how to do. Uh, I, I, I know you can do it. Just don't be afraid. And, and it really gave me this resolve. It gave me this ability to, to keep going. And I finished the bandage change. Uh, it takes like three hours. And afterwards, I, I walked outside, and I was sitting there. And this, it, the story gets a little hokey at this point. I, I was sitting at this camp. It's in Minnesota on these beautiful lakes, and there's these bluffs. And I'm sitting on this, on this bench overlooking this lovely lake. And it had been raining, but the rain clouds had, had cleared, right? And, and of course, a rainbow comes out. And I'm thinking about this, this whole thing. You know, these people who have been dealt such a, a seemingly unfair hand that deal with so much suffering on a scale that is, that it's hard for most people to even conceive of, like a day-to-day -day struggle for survival in the face of, of, of such mind-boggling adversity. Um, they have something really unique and important to give. They have such an important contribution to give. Because <clears throat> for whatever reason, if there is a reason, uh, just the, the, the way um, life happened, they found themselves in that position. And having to live those experiences and learn the lessons that get learned through those kinds of experiences. So I, I don't, so that they can then hand off those insights, that emotional growth th that they have gained through going through this mind-bending life that they're leading, so that the rest of us can benefit from those insights, from that growth, from that learning, from that understanding that they, they've had without having to be the ones to suffer in that way, okay? Um, that's why those people are so important. They're so important, and they, re and they deserve uh, so much respect in our, in our society and support. I, I, I'm not going to apologize for my tears anymore. It, it is an, a really emotional thing, but... Um, I'll leave it at that.